PT College. Over to you, Dr. V. K. Gobi. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, uh, Professor uh, T.P. Joseph, my own teacher. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Shaji, uh, Dr. Gaitri, um, all uh, pediatric colleagues. Today, we shall uh, discuss on anorectal malformations. Uh, uh, when I start narrating, uh, on uh, anorectal malformation, uh, one story is uh, coming to my mind. Uh, uh, the patient uh, whom uh, I had to treat, uh, and uh, that baby was uh, admitted in uh, uh, medical side uh, for uh, bronchopneumonia. Baby had uh, IV antibiotics, IV fluid, uh, and even oxygen. On fifth day, a new housemate came and had a look at the baby and she told the uh, baby's um, uh, anal orifice is abnormal and uh, uh, that uh, created a chaos uh, among the uh, treating fraternity and the baby was immediately taken up for a uh, uh, surgical procedure and the baby improved. So that is the importance. Uh, uh, anorectal malformation uh, uh, diagnosing it is uh, so simple but uh, your thoughts your mind, your eyes should reach the right side. That's important. So, the anorectal malformation uh, is a complex uh, congenital anomaly affecting the rectum and uh, anus. But it doesn't stop there. It involves uh, genitourinary tract also. And there is a spectrum of uh, anorectal malformation from a mild variety with a very good uh, outcome. And uh, severe variety, very difficult to treat, and the prognosis is poor. And incidence wise, uh, anorectal malformation occurs uh, once in uh, uh, 2000 live births. It extends up to, in some survey, it extends up to one in uh, um, uh, 5000 uh, live births. And etiology is not very clear, but uh, likely to be multifactorial. And the chromosomal anomalies are uh, set to contribute in a uh, certain number of cases of anorectal malformation. And the genetic loci are found to be in 7Q39. Maternal exposure to drugs like thalidomide, uh, benzodiazepine, adriamycin, they are uh, supposed to cause uh, anorectal malformation. And maternal infections like a CMV, toxoplasmosis, is also likely to contribute to anorectal malformation. And the nutritional deficiencies are important, especially, especially folic acid deficiency is uh, going to contribute to causation of anorectal malformation. And sex incidence, uh, nothing to comment, almost equal uh, sex incidence. And uh, we should know the embryology. Uh, we should know that uh, primitive gut develops from a uh, yolk sac. So uh, primitive gut is part of yolk sac. And uh, the part of the primitive gut caudal to the communication to the yolk sac is called the hindgut. And the hindgut uh, which is uh, distal to or caudal to the attachment of allendoic diverticulum is called the Cloaca. So cloaca is nothing but a part of primitive gut, the caudal most end of primitive gut. That's clear. So this uh, primitive uh, gut part uh, or cloaca divides into, get divided into by urorectal septum. So there is a septum dividing the primitive cloaca 
into a 90 day part uh, a primitive gut uh, hind gut or a cloaca into a 90 day part that is called the urogenital sinus and the posterior part that is called the primitive rectum and uh, this uh, caudal most part of the cloaca is covered by cloacal membrane and it again getting divided into a posterior anal membrane and anterior urogenital membrane and um, soon uh, the anal membrane is finding that a heap of uh, mesodermal masses are forming distilled to that and uh, soon it finds that it is uh, in the depth of uh, this uh, mesodermal mass, mass masses and uh, that uh, pit like uh, structure is called the proctorium or that is it is also called the anal pit so anal pit contributes to the formation of anal canal and uh, maldevelopment of cloaca and cloacal membrane leads to anorectal malformation that's embryology is it clear so uh, you should uh, start from the primitive gut it's part of yolk sac part of yolk sac and the yolk sac uh, the primitive gut is divided into foregut midgut and hindgut and uh, uh, that is that division is according to the connection between the or communication between the yolk sac and the primitive gut the area of uh, communication to the yolk sac is called the midgut and the area cranial to that area is called the, that part is called the foregut and the area distal to or caudal to that area that part is called the hindgut and hindgut again uh, towards its uh, caudal most part uh, forms the cloaca and cloaca divides into urogenital sinus anteriorly and the primitive rectum posteriorly so if you know this embryology uh, the examiner will see that uh, understand that uh, you will be knowing everything uh, in relation to this topic so by uh, classification um, uh, the because uh, anorectal malformation i told you is a spectrum of disease so from mild to moderate to most severe form so uh, there there have been attempt to classify it and um, that's why different classifications are there so you may please note that um, it is classified uh, initial classification is uh, international classification international classification then came uh, pina's classification pina pna pina's classification then came a uh, krickenberg classification and uh, each uh, class then um, in between uh, we, you uh, mentioned wing spread also wing spread it was a conference classification wind spread, wind spread classification so international wind spread pina and uh, krickenberg this uh, four terms uh, uh, better to know when you are talking about the anorectal malformations and each classification is an improvement of the preceding one and basic thing is a uh, anorectal malformation is uh, classified into high anomaly intermediate anomaly and a low anomaly so high intermediate and low and uh, the principle is uh, when the bowel uh, uh, ends uh, above the anorectal sphincter uh, muscle complex sphincter muscle complex it is called a high anomaly so it does not uh, touch it does not touch the uh, anorectal sphincter it is above the anorectal sphincter that is called the high anomaly when uh, bowel passes through the anorectal sphincter complex and reaches the perineum it is called the low anomaly and in between is the intermediate anomaly so classification is uh, very clear suppose uh, this is the sphincter complex if the bowel ends uh, above the sphincter it is called the high anomaly if it has passed through the sphincter and reaches uh, below the sphincter it is called the low anomaly and in between is the intermediate anomaly so these uh, terms are uh, very simple terms and you should uh, remember so uh, pictorial uh, uh, representation in uh, high anomaly you see uh, the bowel is sending uh, far away from the sphincter muscle complex and the low anomaly you can see the it has passed through the sphincter 
and the reaching the perineum but not opened that is a low anomaly and the intermediate anomaly is in between so clear So uh, this is the original classification uh, types of ARM. It uh, differs from female and uh, male. Basically, anorectal agenesis, eye anomaly, and uh, rectal atresia. These are the two types. Uh, and uh, an anorectal agenesis can be with the fistula, without the fistula. Without the fistula is extremely rare. Almost all cases uh, I have seen, uh, Professor Joseph uh, might have seen. Uh, uh, almost all cases uh, we are uh, seeing fistulous connection. So without fistula is extremely rare, extremely rare. That's the high anomaly. And uh, intermediate anomaly again, anal agenesis on female side and male side, and um, anorectal stenosis on uh, both sides. And again, with the, without fistula and with fistula. With, without fistula is, uh, with the fistula is, uh, a uh, rectovaginal fistula, lower rectovaginal fistula or recto vestibular fistula on the female side and the male side uh, recto bulbar urethral fistula and uh, the previous slide let me stress on the fistula also for the high anomaly on the female side uh, high recto vaginal fistula or uh, recto cloacal fistula that is on the female side recto cloacal fistula high recto vaginal fistula on the female side uh, and on the male side, the recto vesicle fistula, that means the rectum is connected to the bladder. And the recto prostate fistula, that is uh, to the prostatic, the bladder neck prostatic area. So that is the communication in the male. So low anomaly, uh, the opening can be, uh, the uh, bowel ending can be at the normal anal site or uh, at abnormal, uh, at the perineal site. That's the difference. The bowel can end uh, at the perineal site or at the normal anal site. That's at, uh, at the normal anal site on both sides. Uh, at uh, perineal site on both sides. At the perineal site is anocutaneous fistula or uh, anterior perineal anus uh, in male. And female, it's important. Uh, it can be anovalvar fistula or ano vestibular fistula. These are the differences. So uh, uh, classification high, low, intermediate. Then with the fistula, without fistula. And uh, various fistulas, uh, high anomaly it can be to the bladder or to the high, uh, higher part of the upper part of the vagina. Or um, intermediate, uh, it can be to the urethra in the female and uh, in the female uh, lower part of the vagina. And um, low anomaly, uh, it is uh, mainly covered or uh, anocutaneous fistula or anovestibular or anovalvar fistula. So uh, these are the very simple terms. Uh, recto vesicle to the bladder, recto vaginal to the vagina, and recto urethral to the urethra, and then uh, into the vestibule area or a vulvar area that is anovestibular. So uh, these are a few terms uh, which uh, you can uh, remember and write uh, for the exam. And uh, there are rare forms, um, anal membrane, we are talking in embryology, anal membrane, uh, so imperforated anal membrane, anal membrane stenosis. Then in the female, uh, there are uh, more, uh, more uh, types of lesions. One is uh, pineal groove. Uh, you may come across in your practice that um, the vulvar uh, mucosa is continuous with the anal mucosa, the red lining. So patient may come and um, serve the uh, abnormality. Uh, so that is a simpler form of abnormality. Or uh, it can be perineal canal, uh, means a uh, communication between the anal canal and the vagina. Uh, or it can be even persistent cloaca. Cloaca means uh, in embryology we are talking, um, urogenital sinus is formed from um, uh, cloaca. And primitive rectum is also formed from cloaca if uh, it is staying as such. So uh, rectum will open to the uh, that chamber, and um, urogenital sinus, sinus also will open into the same chamber. That is uh, cloaca. Then uh, associated uh, anomalies uh, appropriately uh, 
approximately 50% of cases there will be associated anomalies. And uh, ARM can be syndromic or uh, non syndromic uh, means associated with the syndromes. Uh, chromosomal anomalies we already told them. And you should know vectoral anomalies. V stands for vertebra. A stands for anorectal malformation. C stands for cardiac anomalies. T stands for uh, tracheosophageal fistula. E stands for esophageal atresia. And R for renal anomalies. And L for limb anomalies. So uh, uh, you expand on uh, vectoral anomalies, uh, you can uh, uh, write a uh, lot of things uh, in your uh, answer sheet. And uh, Associated genitourinary anomalies are seen in 40 to 50 percent of cases. Cardiovascular in uh, 30 to 35 percent of cases. And um, it can be spinal cord tethering, gastrointestinal 5 to 10 percent. So higher the anomalies, more chance for uh, associated anomalies. That's the difference. So clinical presentation. Um, is um, non uh, you know non passage of meconium so uh, uh, again uh, i remember one uh, grandmother telling me i was asking uh, whether did the baby pass meconium she said that just today more on wednesday she a baby started passing meconium through the mouth so uh, i was taken aback she is uh, very strong uh, what is the what the baby was so making out was meconium a case of anorectal malformation coming on uh, third or fourth day and if you ask whether Marconi is passed, they will say well, Marconi is coming through the mouth. So that is the situation. So uh, abnormal passage of Marconi, I told you, the fistulas. And the Marconi urea, yeah, when the rectum is connected to the bladder or urethra, baby can pass Marconi through the urethra, that is called the Marconi urea. And um, nematuria, when uh, gas is passing to, uh, through the urethra. And uh, abdominal distension, bilious omitting, dehydration, and uh, in neglected cases, you know, sepsis will uh, settle in. So, excessive oral secretion and the center cyanosis, again, uh, excessive oral secretion is uh, indicative of esophageal atresia and tracheosophageal fistula. Then, um, center cyanosis, you know, cardiac anomalies. So, uh, they are all indicative of uh, associated anomalies. So clinical examination should be thorough, perfect, and complete. And uh, during uh, uh, clinical examination, special attention should be given to abdomen, perineum, genitalia, and spine. And um, in females, um, look at the uh, orifices in the perineum. There should be urethra, there should be vaginal orifice, there should be anal orifice. If there is this, whether these orifices are in a normal position or not, or abnormal position. So very simple uh, uh, clinical diagnosis. And the single opening in the perineum means cloacal anomaly. And poor development of anal dimple, natal cleft, buttocks, um, indicative of poor progress because, because um, these uh, babies are likely to have uh, higher types of anorectal malformation and uh, specifically look for uh, vectoral anomalies. So investigations, um, antenatal USG may not contribute much in isolated anorectal malformation, but uh, in uh, associated anomalies, you can pick up hydrocolpos, pouch colon, hydronephrosis, or um, and even uh, uh, polyhydraminosis observed. And um, I remember uh, having treated a uh, baby in uh, this hospital. In the periphery hospital, they, when they did alt uh, antenatal ultrasound, they detected a mass in the abdomen of the baby. So they were alarmed. Uh, they did uh, uh, cesarean uh, for uh, that indication. So baby having a mass um, in the abdomen. So um, they were alarmed. And that was the indication for LSCS. And when the baby was delivered, uh, and uh, it was found to be anorectal malformation with the pouch colon. Pouch colon. Pouch colon is a variant of anorectal malformation. And mainly seen in uh, North India, very rare in uh, our part of the country. But uh, we had uh, uh, a few patients, and one patient had uh, uh, cesarean delivery only because of uh, 
this uh, pouch colon. Uh, then uh, invertogram. Invertogram uh, is the initial description to find out uh, the types of uh, anorectal bone formation. Uh, but uh, soon it was um, discarded because um, uh, it is uh, quite awkward to keep the baby head down and um, uh, difficulties. Uh, so uh, now the present approach is um, cross table, table uh, lateral pelvic radiograph, uh, which uh, we are also doing. Uh, then um, we should uh, draw the lines, PC lines and I line. You see the picture. Uh, uh, that the uh, PC line. PC line is a uh, ubo coxygen line. Ubo coxygen line. That's a PC line. And it corresponds to upper part of the or upper uh, border of the uh, sphincter muscle complex. And uh, I line uh, is uh, passing through a point in the lower part of the ischium. You can see the ischium, uh, heart shaped bone, and in the lower part you make a point. That is a uh, eye point, and um, a line drawn parallel to the PC line along the eye point is uh, eye line. So PC line, eye line. Eye line uh, corresponds to the lower uh, part of the um, uh, sphincter muscle complex. So when the bowel ends uh, above the PC line, it is a uh, eye anomaly. When the bowel has come beyond the PC line, I line, which is a low anomaly. In between is the intermediate anomaly. So we are seeing a, a case of intermediate anomaly. Intermediate. So PC line, I line. So previously we used to keep a, um, a radiopaque material, a speck of um, a barium or a coin in the perineum and see the invertogram or uh, lateral prone position uh, baby uh, X radiography but uh, you know uh, the perineum uh, of a uh, perineum and the smooth muscle uh, soft tissue of a uh, IUGR baby or preterm baby is far different from a uh, uh, bulky baby of a diabetic mother so uh, so uh, this distance you cannot uh, compare that is why these bony landmarks are taken up bony landmarks are um, uh, reliable dependable Then uh, uh, other investigations are uh, maturating. Uh, we are not doing because uh, keeping the bystander. See, nowadays um, we are practicing what is called um, uh, participatory medicine. Uh, bystander is participating in the treatment. Previously, what we were practicing was a paternalistic medicine because we decide uh, what is to be done. We decide. Uh, uh, what's the diagnosis? We decide what is to be done and uh, we decide the modality of treatment. Now uh, things have uh, changed. Uh, from uh, uh, first came consent, now the uh, consent is informed consent. And the part of informed consent is uh, explain everything uh, about the disease, about the treatments, and about the alternative treatments, and uh, about uh, if no treatment is given also. That also you have to explain. And they have to take a decision. And in this scenario, if you keep the baby in the head down position and they see, they are, and they will be upset. See, when you go to baby emergency hospital, they will keep the baby in the head down and take x ray. So, we will not go there. So, that will be the approach. So, we have to be uh, more patient friendly, bystander friendly, and we have to be, uh, you have to take them into participate uh, in the decision making and treatment. So, uh, uh, that is in a way good, uh, but uh, your headache is uh, taken away. When uh, patients ask me questions uh, about sir, any complication, very very simple for me. I can explain everything. I can explain everything. So where uh, there is complication, so these are the complications. So uh, it is uh, good that they ask questions. Uh, uh, I remember when I was doing uh, saline reduction uh, in the midnight, uh, about 10, 2 a.m. in our hospital. And uh, bystander uh, came uh, with interception uh, of uh, 48 hours uh, duration. And uh, I was uh, quite upset whether it will be successful or not. That time they are asking questions uh, um, uh, whether it will be uh, successful. So it was very simple for me to answer that uh, that question I wanted. I did not explain uh, 
uh, I, I did not go them uh, go to them and explain. So uh, I may not be successful. They asked me whether it would be successful. So I, uh, then um, yeah, I told uh, if it is not successful, uh, uh, I would like to operate and do. So operation, they asked me operation is whether a major operation or not. Then it is simple for me. I am operating in a very sick baby. Maybe a bowel may be gangrenous. So may end up with the resection astomixis. So um, that can produce more of, more problems and future problems. So uh, then finally they asked uh, uh, what will be the cost? And I, I told them uh, according to complications. So cost can go to any level. So uh, then finally they told me, sir, do you do anything possible, anything and everything possible? What we want is uh, let the baby survive. They are not bothered at that phase. So they are not bothered about money. They are not bothered about bill. They are not bothered about complication. What was required is uh, you do something. So that's the advantage of participation. Otherwise, you will be doing and uh, things, and um, uh, then um, they will be worried about the bill. They will be worried about the complication. They will not understand that you are spending, you are putting life into your into your work, and uh, then they will not accept anything. So that system has changed, uh, and uh, uh, we should take it as a positive change. It will reduce your uh, tension. It will reduce your uh, blood pressure. You can explain everything is in uh, Google. Uh, everything is in textbooks. Everything is in uh, available in uh, literature. So uh, I am not doing anything new. What we are practicing is evidence-based medicine. So uh, ultrasonography, uh, both for abdomen and spine. In the initial phases, uh, spine uh, can all, uh, also be evaluated by ultrasonography. Then the CT scanning uh, mainly for uh, osseous structures, uh, which I don't address CT scan at all. And MRI uh, more uh, soft tissue friendly, and um, it may demonstrate the nature of the pelvic uh, uh, floor musculature and uh, the bowel, uh, whether where the bowel ends. This all can be done. Uh, uh, detected uh, or demonstrated in MRI, but um, I don't advise uh, those things only uh, for mentioning theoretical purpose. Uh, these are investigations which you can do. And the uh, cloacogram is um, you are putting dye into the cloaca and see uh, the channel size and the nature. And endoscopy, you can do endoscopy in um, uh, uh, specific cases to see a look for the openings uh, into the cloaca. And assess, assessment of uh, associate anomalies are important because uh, I told you 50% of children with uh, NRP uh, malformation will have uh, associate anomalies. And uh, some of these anomalies uh, may be life threatening, more important uh, than uh, NRP malformation. That's important. Suppose um, cyanotic heart disease, uh, uh, almost incompatible with life. Uh, Baby is having an orchidal push also. So you take up surgery and land a problem. So uh, you need a um, cardiologist's opinion or cardiothoracic surgeon's opinion. So a collective decision and management is required. So in those cases, uh, uh, investigations uh, to be done to find out uh, associated life-threatening anomalies. So echocardiography is an important investigation in this regard. So management, uh, uh, according to whether it is low anomaly, intermediate anomaly, high anomaly. So uh, very simple, low anomaly, you can do perineal operation or uh, uh, from below, uh, uh, lower rated operation or a lower uh, degree of operation. That is um, uh, nowadays, uh, it's called a minimal posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, ESCRP. This, uh, um, uh, I don't know, Professor Joseph will like uh, because uh, we are not practicing this. Uh, but uh, when I look at textbooks, uh, literature, uh, this PS, uh, only PSIRP is coming. I, uh, I read the latest book uh, endorsed by the Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons. In that book, uh, anoplasty is not mentioned, only PSIRP is mentioned. Uh, and um, so they mention also angiosagity and orectoplasty. So these terms, unless you write uh, uh, your examiners uh, 
may not be knowing about aneuplasty, which uh, we are doing similar operation, guaranteed operation. Result is guaranteed. And PSRP and the ASRP and the, their result is not guaranteed. But here result is guaranteed. The patient is incontinent, guaranteed. But the um, uh, problem is uh, that is not mentioned in uh, latest textbooks. Uh, so uh, your examiners uh, may not be knowing. So intermediate anomaly and high anomaly, uh, you have to do uh, better to do diversion colostomy, but uh, 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 there is a variation which I am not mentioning. Intermediate anomaly, diversion colostomy, first. So um, uh, just now I did the uh, one colostomy for uh, anorectal malformation, that is uh, diversion colostomy. Uh, then followed by PSARP, posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, PSARP, PSARP. That term uh, you have to mention. Whenever you are uh, writing on anorectal malformation, you have to mention that term. Another, uh, other oper another operation is the sacroperitoneal mobilization or SPM. Again, uh, this term is not seen in uh, recent textbooks. So uh, whether it is important for you, I don't know. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, lap assisted bowel pulpitor is uh, mentioned. That is uh, mentioned in uh, recent textbooks. And once everything is settled, you have to do closure of the colostomy. High anomaly, same. Diversion colostomy first, then uh, followed by PSRP or abdominal pull through and PSRP. Then uh, the other version is uh, sacral abdominal perineal mobilization or SAP. And uh, here also you mentioned lap assisted pull through. And uh, finally, closure of the colostomy. Long-term complications, uh, we come across uh, long-term complications in these uh, babies. Uh, not a disease uh, to treat and uh, send them away. It is not possible in anorectal malformation. We have to treat them continuously. I have uh, operated in a patient uh, who was uh, 24 year old. He, uh, he had uh, pediatric surgical uh, operations and they left, uh, left, away, uh, left away from pediatric surgery. And he developed a, a fecal fistula at the closure colostomy site, which was closed by a general surgeons two or three times. And meanwhile, he got employment, uh, employment in uh, Gulf. So he went over there. Then he was having this uh, fistula leak, uh, passing motion uh, through the anterior abdominal wall. So um, uh, during discussion among um, their colleagues, um, they were told of, uh, about the baby memory hospital. And they, he came here. So we, we found uh, a fecal fistula at the closure colostomy site. At the age of 25 years, I uh, took him from, for surgery and I closed it and um, he got settled. And he had difficulty. Reception people did not uh, give OP tickets to me. And uh, they have, uh, for the surgery, uh, theater staff nurse, uh, head nurse, uh, she did not allow because uh, this adult surgery. So uh, finally, I had to uh, go and uh, tell them the details and uh, got their concurrence. Then uh, he saw fine now. So uh, there is a continued treatment is required. And um, they, are, they have come across fecal incontinence in a few and constipation and urinary uh, fun function uh, incontinence of urine and the recurrent urine tract infection and sexual function. There is a good number of uh, patients with uh, anorectal malformation uh, encounters sexual function difficulties, erectile dysfunction, impaired ejaculation, dyspareunia, and uh, infertility. And uh, impaired growth and development is also an important point. They are at risk for gross, growth deficit. Development at the days are common and uh, motor dysfunction is also reported. And uh, in nutshell, uh, because this slide, uh, if you go, uh, go for examination and you cannot get time to read everything, uh, this uh, one slide is enough. Because uh, you mentioned about uh, anorectal malformation, its incidence, then uh, class B, low into inter intermediate and high anomaly. You write about PC line, I line, and um, uh, then uh, uh, 
uh, about the four classifications I mentioned and two, two treatment, uh, minimal PSRP or enopathy. And um, then next line of treatment is colostomy, PSRP, prostoglossomy. So this one slide is enough to write a short note. Okay. Okay, uh, here uh, I stop on uh, NR film information. Uh, over to you, sir. Um, uh, Prof. Joseph, uh, most experienced person in our country on NR film information. He will uh, uh, contribute to the discussion. Thank you, no, Dr. Sir. Gobi. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gobi, for uh, that excellent presentation on NR malformation. Uh, Pediatrician is the first doctor to detect most of the pediatric surgical problems and send it to the surgeon. A proper inspection with good lighting of the perineum is all that is required to diagnose anorectal malformation. And it's a common anomaly. And if detected early enough, uh, the surgical outcome is reasonably good. And if there are no life-threatening anomalies, the babies do survive well. But there are long-term complications and they need long-term follow-up. But in general, uh, they have a reasonably social uh, life possible with a long-term follow-up. Any questions from the audience? Any questions to Dr. Gobi? Okay, I think uh, you can go to the next topic, Hirsch Prince. Okay, sir. Yes, Gobi, you can carry on. If there are no questions. One minute, one minute. So, uh, Professor Joseph was uh, telling that uh, a pediatrician is the initial doctor and um, uh, here I am talking on Hestrup's disease, uh, a disease uh, uh, described and uh, designed and uh, handed over to pediatric surgeons by a pediatrician. So Harold Hestrung was a pediatrician, a Danish pediatrician who described everything on Hestrup's disease and uh, we were uh, asked to do something and, uh, and uh, hand over the back, uh, uh, back to him. So. Uh, uh, Hestrung's disease, uh, congenital megacolon or congenital uh, aganglionosis, uh, is a disease of, uh, is a congenital anomaly, of course, uh, uh, caused by migratory failure of uh, neural crest cells, leading to abnormal bowel innovation and uh, peristaltic function. So the ganglion cells uh, are derived from neural crest. So these uh, neural crest cells, uh, travel along the vagus nerve and reach the bowel. And uh, it can get arrested at uh, any stage. And uh, the area beyond uh, this migration is uh, a ganglionic bowel, or uh, that is uh, congenital ganglionosis. So the defect extends from uh, internal sphincter. So that is still most part is uh, internal sphincter 
to variable length of, of the guts and it, it is a leading cause of lower intestinal obstruction in the neonate. In the neonate, uh, it's a leading cause for uh, a neonatal intestinal obstruction. Incidence is uh, one in 5,000 live births. And there is a uh, um, sex incidence of male pro predominance. So it's, uh, it seems it's a disease of male babies. Uh, uh, four is to one, uh, with a four is to one ratio. So when uh, four males are uh, involved, uh, only one female is involved. That's uh, so this ratio is uh, for, uh, specific for the usual variety of Hespong's disease. That is the usual variety is uh, Hespong's with the recto sigmoid transit. So that's the commonest variety. Uh, around the eighty-five percent of cases of Hespong's disease uh, is this variety with the transition zone in the recto sigmoid area. So you, for that variety, this uh, ratio scans uh, well. But uh, for long segments, when the involved segment is longer, that's called the long segment Hespong's disease, the ratio is almost equal. And when it comes to total colonic aganglonosis, it is reversed. There is a sex incidence of uh, female predominance with uh, 1 is to 0.8. So one one female 0.8 uh, male. That is a uh, that is for a total colonic egg anglonosis. So uh, for uh, so uh, uh, for uh, multiple choice uh, or entrance examination, uh, if uh, you are asked uh, what is the sex incidence of um, uh, total colonic egg anglonosis, you should not say uh, four is to one. That is wrong. That is only for recto sigmoid transition. And uh, pathology, uh, I told you, that's absence of uh, ganglion cells. So there is absence of ganglion cells and uh, hypertrophy of uh, nerve bundles. These are the two findings. So these ganglion cells are in the myentic plexus or outbound plexus or intermuscular plexus. Intermuscular plane, there is a plexus that is called the overback or myentic plexus. And in the submucosa, there is a plexus that's called the masonous plexus. In, in both plexuses, these ganglia are present, and uh, in Hespron's, in those in both plexuses, the ganglia are absent, and nerve bundles are hypertrophic. That's the pathology. The uh, ganglionic, uh, a ganglionic segment usually involves uh, rectum and rectus mod. That's 85%. Uh, that I told you. The a ganglionic segment may extend to the entire large bowel or even to the small, uh, small intestine. Or even in their uh, DAT can be a ganglion, incompatible with life. I have seen uh, such patients. The uh, bowel will be foreshortened. So the uh, total length of the bowel, the bowel will be very, very small, and the entire uh, bowel will be abnormally innervated, and that is called the uh, total DAT a ganglionosis. That is uh, incompatible with life. So uh, what happens is, uh, uh, it is a functional obsession. Hespong's disease is a functional obsession, not uh, uh, an anatomical obsession. obsession. Uh, if you put a tube, there is a hole, and the uh, patency is there. The anal canal is open, anal, uh, anal, anal opening is uh, normal, anal canal is um, patent, rectum is patent. So everything is patent. So obstruction is uh, functional. So what happens is when there is a ganglionic bowel, that segment of the bowel becomes spastic, spastic, contracted, contracted. And uh, pro the proximal bowel will, will become uh, dilated, hypertrophied and highly vascular. So you will see uh, very big sized vessels running over the hypertrophied bowel. And um, the bowel is so huge, tire tube like. When you open the abdomen, you see the tight tube-like uh, bowel. So uh, our ancestors, uh, surgeons of, uh, uh, of the past era, they used to resect this uh, large bowel, this uh, dilated bowel, highly abnormal bowel, looking bowel. And the patient will die because you are uh, removing only the normal bowel. So the bowel looks abnormal, hugely dilated. It is not abnormal. It is ab dilated because because of distal obstruction. 
so uh, our ancestors used to remove all those uh, dilated bowel and uh, end up in problem all the patient died before uh, the pathology was uh, clearly demarcated and understood so uh, what is looking normal is abnormal and what is looking normal is abnormal in breast disease and what you have to remove is the normal looking abnormal bowel So usually HD is a solitary lesion, solitary anomaly. Usually HD is a uh, solitary anomaly. Associated anomalies are seen in 20% uh, of patients. Uh, urogenital uh, system, uh, it is 11%. Cardiovascular, 6%. Gastrointestinal system, 6%. Trisomy, 21, 5%. Uh, 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 that's, uh, that's why uh, Dr. Shaji selected the uh, Hespong species and anorectal malformation. In both situations, uh, Down syndrome is affected. So that's why he selected this topic and uh, gave to me. So trisomy 21 uh, in 5%. And uh, premature T is seen in 10% of patients. So uh, uh, I remember treating a, a preterm baby weighing 1 kg with a huge uh, abdominal distension. The last chance of the parents, because uh, mother was already 42, father was uh, nearing 50. So last possible uh, pregnancy. And this baby had a uh, huge abdominal distension because of um, ileal perforation, ileal perforation. So when we operate, uh, when we uh, unravel the pathology, it was total colonic egg ganglionosis and uh, ileal dilatation and ileal perforation and the pneumopathy. So that baby weighed, uh, was preterm, weighed only one kg and uh, I offered them um, a chance of survival of uh, 5%. They are told even if there is 1% chance of survival, you should go ahead. And uh, finally, we did the uh, ileocecostomy. Then baby, uh, uh, baby improved. Then later, uh, we did the uh, total colonic resection and the ileal pull through. And uh, he, now he is studying for the degree course. So uh, there is a pretext. So there is a chance of uh, preterm also. So you cannot write away, uh, write off uh, anybody uh, from uh, his prong. But that's also possible. So uh, clinical features, uh, you know, uh, failure to pass meconium. That's most important. So 98% uh, of neonates will, uh, uh, term neonates will pass uh, meconium within the first 24 hours. And uh, then uh, evidence of neonatal intestinal obstruction in the form of constipation, abdominal distension, ileus omitting, refusal to feed, and rec recurrent endocolitis, and failure to thrive. So uh, if untreated, uh, only 10% of them will uh, reach the first birth. Uh, you take all Hespong's disease and uh, leave them alone. Only 10% will be there to enjoy first birth. 90% will die because of various problems, sepsis, recurrent neurocolitis, uh, I told you, perforation, then uh, failure to thrive, uh, that's the uh, situation. So you have to get the detailed history of meconium, bowel habits. Uh, sometimes uh, they may tell that the baby is passing motion every day, but there may be very scanty motion, very scanty motion. So that's a presentation. And the physical examination, um, of course, uh, there will be distended abdomen with uh, in older children, fecal masses may be palpable. And rectal examination, uh, rectum will be empty, but uh, once you take out the tube or a finger, uh, there will be gush of stool and gas. That's a uh, presentation. And uh, investigation wise, so you take uh, pain x ray abdomen, which will show multiple fluid levels, and especially the colonic dilatation. This, uh, what you see in the periphery. That is the colonic dilatation. You, you can see the fluid level. And at the same time, rectum is empty. There is no gas in the rectum. And uh, uh, this is a baby with uh, endocolitis with perforation. You can see the pneumopetonium. You are, the, you are seeing the pneumopetonium. Gas under diaphragm. And in your station, uh, it's a contrast enema. This very enema we do. And instill uh, through a snake lifting uh, an oracle tube, and you will see the transition zone. You can see the narrow bowel and the dilated bowel. 
it's a that transition between the narrow bowel to the dilated bowel is called the transition zone. That's important. If the picture is atypical, you have to take a 24 hour picture, which may show medium uh, hold up, medium fold. So, uh, in uh, total colonic again, lonosis, the colon will be featureless and for short condition. And you see, you will see that varium is entering into the ileum. And uh, contrast anemia is with uh, uh, false positivity and false negativity for uh, uh, so specificity and uh, sensitivity are uh, not 100 percent. So only uh, 75 to 80 percent uh, uh, chance of diagnosing her two cases by contrast anemia alone. Then comes anorectal manometry. It has got a specificity or uh, accuracy of up to 95 percent. Here you are, uh, it, uh, you are testing for uh, the uh, sphincter uh, response to a stimulus. That is called uh, uh, rectoanal uh, uh, muscle complex uh, yeah, response to um, a stimulus. It is uh, 75 to 75 percent to 95 percent accuracy. It is having 75 percent to 95 percent accuracy. Uh, so this rectoanal inhibitor reflex, that is called RAIR, rectoanal inhibitor reflex, that is uh, lost in head species. Rectoanal inhibitor reflex is uh, RAIR is uh, lost in head species, but it is preserved in the habitual constitution and other diseases. That is uh, anorectal manometry. Then uh, histopathology is the definitive and gold standard, uh, the definitive test and the uh, gold standard for diagnosing uh, uh, Hedgehog's disease. It has got accuracy of uh, 98% uh, or almost 100%. So method, methods of uh, biopsy are uh, suction biopsy or punch biopsy, uh, which will uh, give you um, a mucosa and submucosa. And the full thickness biopsy, where you get the th full thickness of the bowel, and it can be achieved by laparoscopy or laparotomy. And uh, you call it uh, leveling bi biopsy because uh, you take a uh, biopsy from multiple sites, then you will uh, reach from the ganglionic to the ganglionic area. It's called the leveling biopsy. This uh, bowel resection and biopsy is called the donut uh, biopsy. So, in there, uh, Full thickness, uh, one circle of uh, cell is uh, taken for biopsy. That's called a donut to biopsy. The methods uh, in histology are uh, norm normal uh, formalin fixed tissue, uh, hematoxylin eosin staining. That's a uh, normal uh, which we are doing. And another one is fresh frozen biopsy, uh, biopsy or uh, fresh frozen tissue biopsy, where uh, again the hematoxylin eosin staining is done. Then uh, you've got the enzyme histochemistry. They are using acetylcholinesterase or NADPH diaphrase. Then uh, you've got the immunohistochemistry so with the C-kit and the calretinib. C-kit and the calretinib. So formalin fixed tissue, press portion tissue, enzyme, enzyme histochemistry, and uh, immunohistochemistry. These are the four uh, methods in histology. Then uh, you have to talk about the differential diagnosis. So these are the possible uh, differential diagnosis. Meconium plaque syndrome, you know, small left colon syndrome usually seen in uh, uh, babies of diabetic mothers. Then ileal or uh, colonic atresia. So there also you can see microcolon. Meconium there you can see microcolon, hypothyroidism, and uh, sepsis. And um, you know, high habitual constipation also comes under different differential di di diagnosis because um, you may come across older children, not only neonates. I have come across even adults. So I have operated on a patient who was 25 years old with respiratory. So they can pull on like that. So treatment uh, 
uh, is uh, the purpose of treatment is uh, remove the abnormal. That is the ganglionic bowel. So you have to restrict the abnormal uh, bowel. That is called the rectosigmoidectomy. And uh, you do the pull through of the ganglionic bowel. That's the treatment. So it is accomplished as a single stage procedure or a, as a staged procedure. Single stage means uh, you do everything together. The bowel pull the section and the pull through is done at the same time. That is called a single stage procedure. And uh, stage is uh, you do colostomy first, especially in the newborn period, you do colostomy first. And later, when the baby is uh, grown enough to stand the major operation, you do the bowel pull through. And this is accomplished by uh, uh, either Duhamel operation, Swenson operation, or Soyavi operation. These are the three pull through techniques Duhamel, Soyavi, Swenson. And um, another one is uh, uh, transanal endorectal filter. Transanal endorectal filter. So, uh, most commonly done uh, operation is uh, Duhamel operation. And another one is uh, uh, transanal uh, endorectal pull through. Uh, nowadays, a uh, lap assisted pull through also is being done. Lap assisted pull through. So, the, uh, in the specimen, you are seeing a uh, resected uh, total colonic uh, egg anglonosis and uh, the smaller limb is the ilium. So, this baby had a uh, transition zone in the ilium. So, we have to remove a uh, part of ilium and total column. That's the receptor specimen, and uh, this bulky area is the area of uh, ileocecostomy. So uh, we come to an end here. Over to Professor Joseph uh, for uh, comments and contributions. Very good presentation, Dr. Gobi, about two sort of similar anomalies, both intestinal obstruction due to the distal most part of the large intestine. The first one, a total anatomical obstruction. The second one, a functional one. The first one can be diagnosed by physical examination, while the second one, a good history. My, my advice to the budding pediatricians is to spend one or two minutes in history taking and maybe in physical examination as well. Lack of Passage of meconium in the first 24 hours or improper passage of meconium. Suppose small amounts of meconium is passed. Again, abnormal looking meconium all point to Hirschsprung disease. If we miss a Hirschsprung disease in the newborn, some of them can go to childhood, adulthood, as uh, Dr. Gobi already said. Uh, I first uh, treated the Hirschsprung who was already 21 years when I was doing my MCH in Trivandrum. And uh, myself and Dr. Gobi have operated one 25-year-old, which he was mentioning, which was diagnosed only at, the, at that age. The main difference between the two, anorectal has got a large number of associated anomalies. And the long-term outcome from the continents is reasonable, but not uniformly good. But Hirschsprung's, on the other hand, with appropriate treatment, we can expect these children to lead a near normal life, socially as well as continence-wise. Almost excellent outcome, except in that small 20% with associate anomalies. Thank you, very good presentation. Now, any questions or doubts for the... Gobi, you on... Uh... Common problem which you all see is constipation in children. Uh, usually it's non-organic habitual. So when a person comes to you with recurrent constipation, when do you start thinking in terms of a Hirschsprung's because the child has already passed meconium in the first 24 hours and there's no history to that. So how frequently would you think of doing an investigation for that? So, uh, uh, as you know, uh, initial management is uh, medical. Um, your um, uh, dietary modulation and the laxatives and um, no response at all. Uh, and um, the one clue is uh, painless certification is a point in favor of response disease. And the soiling is a point uh, in favor of uh, habitual constipation. 
so uh, um, dietary modulation and um, laxatives and uh, no response abdominal distension is remaining and when when you take x ray if you are seeing a fluid level you should be alerted to investigate then um, if no response to laxatives of sufficient length uh, time and uh, if they are taking medicine properly and um, abdominal distension is remaining those are the cases where you should do very anima and um, when in doubt uh, you can do what is called a uh, 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 muscle biopsy rectal biopsy uh, rectal biopsy has got uh, an advantage uh, when you do a rectal biopsy you are dividing a sphincter a internal sphincter and uh, in a in a very rare situation of ultra short segment gastric disease which is very difficult to diagnose uh, that will be curative also so uh, uh, that's the way you go ahead so uh, when you, when uh, it is intractable uh, and um, when uh, abdominal distension is remaining then uh, when x ray shows uh, fluid levels then uh, indication for uh, and painless defecation and no soiling these are the uh, indications for uh, investigation any other questions so i have a query yes welcome yeah go ahead uh, yes uh, so in uh, many textbooks they mention to look at the skin bowel distance in case of arm and if the skin bowel distance is less than 1 cm you go for either anoplasty or pinsar and if the skin bowel distance is more than 1 cm you do colostomy so we routinely do we follow that skin bowel distance does it have any relevance yeah that's not relevant because, because i told you uh, the skin bowel distance uh, in a and an iugr uh, preterm baby will be different from a very bulky baby so the uh, skin bowel uh, distance will be contributed by soft tissue also so soft tissue thickness uh, varies from baby to baby that's a problem so we uh, we uh, go by uh, bony landmarks and bony landmarks are uh, um, uh, uh, demonstrated by pc lane and i lane so uh, okay. we have to do by uh, go by pc lane i lane thank you sir